Some of you may have heard me share about my conversation with the faculty at the Irish Bible Institute this last October. I was asked to fly to Ireland, as most of you in the church know, to be the guest speaker for a dual graduation. Because of COVID, they weren't able to have graduation in 2020, so they had, last October, they had graduation for the 2020 class and the 2021 class. And in between the two, there was about two hours, and those of us who were on faculty uh, gathered into a side room at the facility. We uh, had some lunch meats and some snacks, and we just gathered around. And it was interesting because even though I'm teaching by Zoom from the States, so it's expected that they hadn't seen me in person, they hadn't seen each other in person for a long time because of COVID. So it was like a little mini reunion. Would have never known that I was in the States. But still, the attention drew to me at one moment where they all wanted to know, so Jonathan, what's it like preaching and every week and being a pastor in Michigan? And I said to them, because I couldn't miss the opportunity, I said, I'm the safest pastor in America. Said, what? What do you mean you're the safest pastor in America? I said, oh, yeah. I said, if some gunman, because that's, you know, their, um, their image of America, if some gun, gunman comes in here or some bad person comes here and here, if they manage to make it past our security, which I don't think they will, but if they did and they tried to come into the church, they'd have to make it past the adults, which I doubt they will. But if they manage to make it past security and past adults, they got to make it past the kids. All right. <laughs> And they'll never make it past the kids. To which they're all looking at me like, what? Like, I wish we could have seen the look on their faces. It was, it was, uh, it was worth it all. But then I told them with 100% honesty, I love our church. And I love being the pastor of our church. And I know someone else who loves God and loves the church, or at least his version of the church, and that's the author of Psalm 84. It's a psalm for all people who want to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And it's a psalm of pilgrimage. Three times every year, the people of Israel had to go to Jerusalem. They had to go to Zion to worship God at the temple. And wherever they came from in their journey to Jerusalem, they would sing songs. They would sing songs on their journey we call these pilgrim songs and we all know that music makes a journey shorter doesn't it if you've traveled across the u.s in a car in an automobile like ron's going to be doing here pretty soon going to take his son to california you got to have music right but see in those days they didn't have itunes they could just pop in a cd but they had a song book called the psalms and they had songs just for this occasion. Most of these are in Psalms 120 through 134. We call these the pilgrimage songs. But there are a few others scattered throughout the book of Psalms, and Psalm 84 is one of them. So with that in mind, I want to look at Psalm 84 this morning. And the first thing we're going to discover is that I am healthy when I am longing for God. I'm healthy when I'm longing for God. Let me read this. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Now this first verse, verse 1, talks about the dwelling place, and, and that's the temple. Uh, in the Old Testament era, God dwelt among his people in the midst of his people at the temple. Now, of course, we all know that God is omnipresent. He, he's everywhere. He's not limited to the temple, but that is where he chose to make his dwelling place, so to speak. And so that's where they went from all over uh, the country and even outside of Israel. They would come to this temple in Jerusalem to worship God. And I want us to bring this psalm into the 21st century and see it as a psalm about coming to the church. And in verse 2, he says, my soul longs for the courts of the Lord. And this, this word soul, the Hebrew word nephesh, 
it is a, it's an interesting word. It means my, inner, my innermost being, the, the, the depths of my being. It's, with, it's in the depths of his being that the psalmist cries out to be with God. In other words, this is true heartfelt worship. This is, this is a genuine desire to be with God, to be in his presence. And you know what? I know how he feels. In my heart and my soul, I love to worship the Lord, and I love doing it here at Grace every Sunday. The psalmist doesn't have that luxury. He has to travel to Jerusalem to worship and gather with God's people in the presence of God at the temple. And you know, every Sunday we should be thinking, wow, what a great thing it is to be gathering here with other Christians to praise God in song and to hear the Word of God preached, to worship God together. Man, is that awesome or what? I think maybe sometimes we take that for granted. Verse 3, he says, Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. You know what? During the days of the temple, if birds were built, uh, if they built their nests around or even on the temple, it was allowed. They were allowed to remain there. The psalmist imagines how fortunate these birds must be to always be around the Lord. That's, that's the idea here. He's, well, he's kind of envious of the birds, the swallows and the, and the sparrows that get to make their nest at the temple. And not only is the bird safe in its home there on the temple, it's safe near the altar. Now think about that. They're safe near the altar. You know, the altar where they sacrifice Bulls, goats, sheep, and birds, right? So they're even safe near the altar. Sparrows, swallows, friar birds, hoary puff legs, the grouse, all those birds, they're safe near the altar. And man, if they're safe near the altar, imagine how safe we are. Remember in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, remember, I've shared this quote before. Mr. Beaver said to Susan, safe. Who said anything about safe? Of course, Aslan isn't safe, but he's good. I understand what C.S. Lewis is saying, and I, and I appreciate his point, but I'll tell you one thing. You can lay your sleeping bag down outside Aslan's tent, and you'll be safe. You're as safe there as anywhere in the universe. Donald Barnhouse was an early 20th century theologian. He wrote this, I look down some little street, and I see a humble chapel where a group of simple people worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, despised and rejected of men, even as was their Lord. And I know that this is the rich reality of spiritual truth. Here are the sparrows who find their nest at the cross of Jesus Christ. Here is worthlessness that finds its worth because the Savior died. Well said, Barnhouse. And you know what's even better than being near the temple? being in the temple. Verse 4, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Do you know who dwelled in the house of the Lord? It was the priests and the, and the temple officials. And in the 21st century, we might say, well, that's the pastor. That's the pastor. Now, kids, just to clarify, I do not live here, Okay. I love this church, but I don't want to live here. I don't want to sleep here. The only bed in the church is a crib downstairs, and I moved out of one of those a long, long time ago. I don't plan on going back. Besides, there's a camera down there, and Mike is always watching. And I don't want to sleep with Mike watching me. Do you want to sleep with Mike watching you? Nobody wants to sleep with Mike. But I spend a lot of time here, more than anyone else, and I love it. I love my job. It's the best job in the world. Sometimes I will come here right in this auditorium and I will sit down. Sometimes I'll even lay down when I absolutely know that nobody's coming and I will pray. I love this place. I love being here. And sometimes I'll fire up that piano and I'll play and I'll sing when I'm all alone here. Or on occasion, 
It's true, I should probably warn you, so I made sure I put it in my message, that you might walk through the doors if I don't know you're here, and you might hear Michael W. Smith being blasted very loudly from my office, from my sound bar. The younger ones will be like, see, Mom, even the pastor plays his music loud. And then the moms would say, yeah, but your pastor's going deaf, too, so you don't want to go deaf, do you? I love hanging out in this place. I understand how the psalmist feels. Some of you are struggling to find time to study your Bible. I get to study the Bible all the time. I get paid for it. It's the best gig in town. I think the psalmist would say, I, I envy you, dude, man. You are blessed. I know. I am healthy when I am longing for God. I am healthy when I am looking forward to meeting with God. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. In other words, blessed is the person who gets fired up as he longs to worship God. That person has found strength in their walk with the Lord. You know, there's a lot of hunters in this church. Hunters, yeah, there are hunters. There are fishermen in this church. And there are those who love to eat. Yes, you love to hunt, you love to fish, and you love to eat. I know, I've seen you. There are, you know, by the way, I'm not going to even try to guess what you women do with your time. That's a mystery to me. I'm just not even going to go there, try to go there. But hopefully all of you will learn or have already learned not to get your fulfillment from these kind of things. Because you know what? Eventually, you'll get to the point in your life where those things just leave you feeling empty. They're fun. They're exciting. I think they're a gift from the Lord but they don't ultimately fulfill. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. But if your greatest joy is pursuing God, working on your relationship with Him, now that will satisfy you throughout the length of your life. You know, virtually none of you come here on the fourth Wednesday of every night, or every month, excuse me, the fourth Wednesday where we have prayer meeting. Uh, there's just a handful of us who come regularly, and you know who you are. But let me tell you, that's really too bad. Some of you have come on occasion, and then you've told me later, I was really, really blessed. Yeah, that's what you're missing when you, come, when you don't come on a, on a Wednesday night. Because you don't get to hear Tyler Beanster pray, or Leah Farrell, or last, last time. Elijah Nyhoff. What a blessing that was. We pray, we hang out a bit. Doesn't last long. But I wonder how many of you would come on a Wednesday night to our small little prayer meeting on the fourth Wednesday of every month. If the governor of Michigan made a law that said it is illegal for you to come to church to pray. Now, if the governor of Michigan said it was illegal, how many of you would show up on Wednesday? Yep, yep, that's right. Yeah, that would bring us out, wouldn't it? There is a Catholic news site called the Catholic Arena. Look it up. They just published this article 10 days ago. So this is literally off the press, right? Hot off the press. Listen to this. In a complete panic after the overturn of Roe v. Wade in the United States, Ireland's incompetent government is now moving to establish anti-prayer zones across the country where a person can be jailed for praying against abortion or for encouraging people to give birth to their baby instead of killing it. The establishment has waged a long and lackluster war on pro-life prayer in and in an effort to justify such zones, yet now they are proceeding regardless of any real evidence. Footage also emerged of far-left activists who appeared to support the government pelting elderly Catholics with eggs because they were praying in public. In another effort, 
the Social Democrats, who were founded by current Minister for Health Stephen Donnelly, waged a campaign against Catholic, Catholics who wished to pray outside their closed church under state restrictions. Ten days ago. The Lord said, if the, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Listen, listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about coming to worship. He said, the blessedness of worship belongs not to the half-hearted, listless worshipers, but to those who throw all their energies into it. Neither prayer nor praise nor the hearing of the word will be pleasant or profitable to persons who have left their hearts behind them. That's so true. The psalmist says, my heart is on the highway to Zion. What journey is your heart on these days? Where are you heading? Not sure where the Valley of Baca is located. None of us are. But apparently, it was a dry place that was transformed into a place of springs while they were on their journey to Jerusalem. And it was there that they were refreshed and strengthened. And I want you to know that as we walk and journey toward God, with God, we get transformed because He journeys with us. I was just marking a paper this last week, uh, my last paper. I shouldn't be marking papers or grading papers, excuse me, in American English. I shouldn't be grading papers. But I had one student who uh, got special circumstances with IBI's uh, director of studies, and he submitted it late. So I got an email from, from my, my director over there in Ireland, and he said, uh, Jonathan, I'm sorry, I got one last Old Testament paper. Would you mark it? I said, sure, of course I will. I'll be happy to do it. So I did. It was a timeline. It was the assignment on the Old Testament, and you had to fill out what you thought were the key highlights of the Old Testament within so many words. And then you had to put uh, next to that uh, a couple of sentences describing it. And so, of course, and appropriately, the very first thing he put on his timeline was creation. And he wrote a few words about it, and then he wrote about the fall. And then he wrote a few words about it, and he ended this, that sentence on the fall with, and then God abandoned Adam and Eve. I wrote in the comment section, no, he didn't. They were banned from the garden, but not from the presence of God. Look at the very next chapter. In Genesis 4, we find Cain and Abel and God. He's there. He didn't abandon them. Our journey in life can be hard. And maybe you know that personally. You know what? When you find yourself in the valley, look for God in the valley. He's not just up in the mountains. Look for him in the valley. He'll be there with some fresh water and he wants to refresh you. And go ahead, test him and see if he doesn't lead you from strength to strength. Then the psalmist gives this prayer. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. And we, we see him talking about a shield. A shield to whom? Who is he shielding us from? From the enemy. The enemy doesn't want you to be refreshed. The enemy doesn't want you to meet with God or to come here and worship with God or to live for God. He wants to sidetrack you from that journey. He knows that if he can get your attention, then you'll be inclined to live independently with little concern for spending time with the Lord. Yeah, he's smart. He's tricky. The, law, the psalmist says, Lord, be my shield. And then comes what I consider to be the coolest part of this, of this psalm. 
with our eyes fixed on Jesus, we are downright blessed when we're living in the presence of God. Verse 10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Imagine that. I would rather be a doorkeeper. So would I. I'd rather be a trash man in heaven than a king in the other place. Yes, I would. This week I sat down to watch the news and I got there just a little bit too late, turned on the television and it wasn't the news, it was Wheel of Fortune. Anybody remember Wheel of Fortune? Anybody ever watch Wheel of Fortune? Yeah, so I sat there for 10 minutes to watch it because, man, I can't remember the last time it was I watched Wheel of Fortune. And so this lady spins the wheel and it lands on trip. Didn't know they had trips. Landed on a trip. And wouldn't you know, yep, she wins uh, the, that particular, she guesses the right letter, she wins the, the, the puzzle, she guesses it right, and the host says, well, let's find out what you got. She flips it over, and the guy says, it's a trip to Rome! And she's so excited, and she's jumping up and down, and going, wow, I'm going to Rome! And, I'm, you know, and she's going, ah, ah, you know, and it's, she's so happy, and I'm thinking to myself, I've been there. Been there a couple of times, actually. Uh, it was much more exciting the first time I went. So I thought, where would I want to go? Like, if I could go on a vacation anywhere, where would I want to go? Don't ask my wife, because, you know, she won't like it. Uh, and I thought, well, where would I want to go visit, really? Like, what would be the, the ultimate destination for a week of vacation? And then it struck me, you know what? I want to go to vacation to heaven. Yeah, I want to go visit heaven. Visit, you know, don't want to stay there yet. Um, I, I, I just want to go visit for now. Um, that's where I'd like to go. Can you imagine how amazing that would be? Visit heaven for a week. I, I have to admit to you, I've had some really cool experiences in my life. I, I really, really have. I, I've been blessed. Um, I've been rafting on the Colorado River. Anybody been rafting on the Colorado River? Been rafting? How about rafting a really cool river that wasn't the Colorado? Okay, because I can see some of you go, oh, what's it the Colorado? Uh, I've been uh, thrown off my feet from jets taking off and landing in, in, in St. Martin. Yep, that's true. I'm one of the idiots standing there, you know, when that thing blasts off. And yeah, I actually grabbed my wife to do it too. She had no choice, but we're here, we're alive. Um, I've ridden a camel. Up to Mount Sinai, I've, I've snorkeled in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. I've ziplined with my brother uh, across the, the longest zip line in the world in Puerto Rico. Remember that, Ron? That was awesome. But you know what? As fun as those cool experiences were, there is nothing in the world that equates to, for example, when a group of us had communion at the garden tomb. Or when a group of former students and I sang Little Town of Bethlehem at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Or when I baptized my children in the Irish Sea. As fun as those other things were, I would never trade them for those more precious experience. There isn't a vacation on that wheel I would choose over those moments. The psalmist says, and I agree, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Not only have I had some really cool experiences in the life, but but I have also been blessed with some really, really wonderful friends, some really wonderful brothers and sisters in Christ. Just this last July, you knew that Becky and I flew out to San Francisco to visit her parents. And while I was there, I had a chance to reunite with one of my old buddies, Gary Gadini. Gary is just one of my closest friends in life. I love Gary. I admire him. He's 
He's one of the best preachers I've ever heard. He's so, so much better than me. So I look up to him and I, I admire him. And, and when I saw him, it was like no time passed at all. It was like we had just seen each other yesterday. And not only that, but we had a chance to worship together. And he came, first he spoke. He was the first of two speakers. And then after he spoke, he came down, sat next to me in, in, the, in the pews, and, and he put his armor on me. And then we worshiped together. That was, that was a, a joy. It filled my tank. This morning, our, our friends, the Kurs, are here from, from Grand Rapids. They tr uh, didn't have to travel so far as I had to go to San Francisco, but we have great memories with them. You guys remember walking around Tosa del Mar and the Costa Brava along the Mediterranean? Remember that? That was, that was fun. That, that's something we'll never forget in Spain together. But you know what? As much as I loved doing that with the Kurs and as much as I've loved some of the great things I've done with you, let me tell you what, you know what? There is no one that I would rather hang out more with than Jesus himself. If I could go on a vacation with Jesus, that would be the ultimate. Just to be around him. That's what we get to look forward to. Can you imagine that? If Aladdin appeared to me and said, Jonathan, I'm going to give you one of two wishes. You can either be the wealthiest man in the United States, but you'll never be able to go to church again. Or you'll live around the poverty level, but you can go to church anytime you want. I'll take the second one. I'll take the poverty level. Because I want the life that Jesus promised. And that means being with you and worshiping with you. I'd rather have Jesus than all the silver or gold in the world, you know? If I have Jesus, I am already rich. And then in verse 11, the psalmist says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Man, what an amazing verse. Look at this. This is incredible. He says, The Lord God is a sun and shield. We've already heard he's a shield. But then look at this. He says, the Lord bestows favor and honor. Favor and honor. Favor, okay, being the Hebrew, it's, it's grace. Some of your versions might even say grace, depending on your English version. But it's grace, yeah. He bestows grace and honor. You know, grace isn't just a New Testament thing. Imagine there are so many people who need to experience God's grace. He smiles on us even when we don't deserve it. That, that's someone's brief definition of grace. You know what? If you've ever wondered how God could ever forgive you, then you understand grace. You know you don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. That's grace. But he doesn't just bestow grace. The psalmist says he also gives honor. Imagine that. You know, there are people all over this world who are looking for honor, for fame, for glory, for recognition. Well, I'll tell you what. This last year was an interesting year for Hollywood. The whole Johnny Depp, Amber Heard fiasco really opened the eyes of a lot of people it kind of revealed the mirage of hollywood and so writer after writer journalist after journalist finally were able to say isn't that sad isn't that sad how messed up is that is that what you want is that what you're looking for world god says you know what do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. And that is how you will be honored. People won't love you because you're an actor or an actress. They won't love you because you're, you're rich or powerful. You won't have to worry who's your true friend or who's not really your friend, 
who's just trying to befriend you so they can gain some sort of advantage. You know what? You'll be honored for your character. You'll be loved, respected, cherished, and admired because you're a man or a woman of God. That's the reward God gives. And then we read, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk in uprightly. David put it this way, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Paul put it this way, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Oh yeah, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. What a promise and encouragement. But you know, there's a key word there, the word walking uprightly. That's sort of the key, isn't it? We can't sing, I did it my way throughout life and expect God to bless our socks off. It doesn't work that way. But when we live obediently and we're walking uprightly, then yeah, we're going to feel the rain. That's what the psalmist says, and that's why he can confidently conclude, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. You know, perhaps one of the things that causes this psalm to stand out from all the other 149 is that this psalm has the highest concentration of blessing in all the psalms. Yeah, the word blessed appears three times in just 11 verses. It's more than any other psalm in that regard. You know what? Looking for God, longing to be with Him, loving Him, living in His presence, it's a blessing. But you know what's mind-boggling? What's mind-boggling is that the reverse is true as well. God longs for us. God longs to be with us, to love us, and he wants to be in our presence. Does that, does that boggle your mind? Because it boggles mine. God wants to be with me. God wants to be with you. That should encourage you. Well, we need to wrap this up. I want all of us to walk away this morning remembering this. For the psalmist, he imagined that the ultimate blessing would be to work in the temple. To be in the temple. That, that to him was the ultimate blessing. That's what this psalm is all about going to the temple to be in the presence of God. You know what, Christian? Now it is our blessing to be the temple. We don't have to go to the temple. We are the temple. Paul says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. We can be the temple because of what Jesus Christ did for us. He's the one that made that possible. That's why we come and we worship him. And knowing that should change the way we live, the way we act, the way we think. But you know what? Temples get cluttered. They do. So God instituted a program whereby we can come on a regular basis and we can clean the temple. We can relight the lampstand that may be flickering. We can come to the altar to nourish our souls. We can come to worship, not as individual little temples, but we can come together as one, one temple, one body in Christ. You know, uh, one of the worst moments for us in our years living in Ireland was the, was the moment when we had our house broken into. Uh, we were all with my in-laws um, in a, a town about half an hour away, just uh, going out to eat and having a good time. Came back, walked in the house, and saw stuff tossed everywhere. 
And I walked into the back. My first thought was, probably typical of, of being the man of the house, and maybe you guys would have thought, like, how did they get in? That's the first thing that came to my mind immediately. How, how did they do this? How did they get in? And I walked immediately to the back where I suspected, and I was right, we, we had a glass, what's it called again? A, yeah, it's like a greenhouse, but it's not. It's attached to the house, and it's not green. But anyway, so we had like uh, this uh, outdoor room that was glass, and sure enough, they had busted the glass, opened the door, and that's how they got in. I went upstairs right away. Uh, the other family members were looking for the dog to see if she was still there and if she was alive, and she was shaking to death under one of the beds upstairs. And I walked into our bedroom, and it was tossed. It was tossed. Becky's jewelry was everywhere. They had taken the jewelry I'd given her for our honeymoon and for one of her anniversaries. The police came, the guards as we call them, and they came, and uh, we had to file a report, and they looked around, and, and they said, yeah, I'm really surprised they didn't take your TV. But then the TV wasn't like one of these new ones. And they said, how much did they take? And I said, well, actually, not a whole lot because we didn't really have much worth taking. But they took some things, like my wife's jewelry that I've given to her. And he goes, well, you're one of the fortunate ones. He said, the people that have been doing this in this area are looking for drug money. So they're looking for what they could sell fast, make some quick cash so that they can get what they need. And you know what? Truth is, it didn't really hurt us that much financially. Not really. But I was angry. That, that's what I was. I was angry. I, I've, I've heard of other people who have gone through this. The guards were like, you know, here, they give me this card, you know, like if you need counseling, you know, I don't, I don't need counseling. I'm just ticked off, you know? Some people I've talked to who have experienced the same, like they felt violated. They felt like someone had come, you know, and they couldn't sleep for a while. Nah, that, 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 none of that affected me. I was just, I was angry. They came into my house and they violated my home. So yeah, I was angry. How would you feel if it was your house? Not much was taken, your, your family's fine, your dog's fine. They just broke in and tossed things around. Yeah, I was angry. You know what? I wonder if the Holy Spirit doesn't sometimes feel the same way when he looks at his temple, when he looks inside here. Say, now this is the temple that was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's being trashed. The enemy is having its way in my temple. Let me encourage you this week, encourage myself, all of us, that the enemy does not need to have their way in this temple. Let's pursue the Lord. Let's long for him. Let's live in his presence every day. Come back here. Get refreshed. Drink of the well. Go from strength to strength. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Let's pray. Father God Almighty, we love you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for inspiring this psalmist to write this psalm, Psalm 84. And we concur. It is wonderful to be in your temple. It is wonderful to be in your church. It is wonderful to gather together with one another to worship you. Lord, help us to be faithful. In a country and in a world where people are dropping off of churches like, like nothing else. Let us continue to be a light here in Hamilton. 
pursue, pursue you and seek you and long for you and to enjoy your presence in our lives. That, Lord, we will not give away. Be glorified in our church and in our lives, Lord Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen.